Welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to a special live stream on Earth Day. In Here a, we are on Earth. On Earth in a beautiful uh, Surrounded nature Surrounded by preserve. nature. Yeah. yeah, couldn't do it better for 21 Earth Day. Yeah. Um, here to talk about the launch of the largest prize ever, a uh, $100 million X Prize for carbon capture, and here with a very special guest, uh, probably one of the greatest innovators and engineer of our time, the CEO of Tesla, of SpaceX, of a bunch of other companies, uh, and someone I'm proud to call a friend. Elon. Hey, Peter. Good to uh, see you. Good to see you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the perfect setting for our conversation today. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've known each other for a long time now. Yeah. Um, 21 years, I think. It was like 2000? Yeah. Whoa. It is. I think it was 2000. Yeah. In, in like uh, Brazil. Brazil. It was Actually, uh, in a similarly nice uh, sort of setting. Yeah, it was the day of his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Florianopolis. And Florianopolis. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, you're trying to convince me not to start a rocket company. I was trying to convince you to fund the original X Prize well, before it, I met Anusha. Yes, but you also said, you're like really advised me not to start a rocket company because I'd lose all my money, which I thought uh, I thought you were probably right. <laughs> so uh, I thought we're, you know a 10 percent chance of success, but anyway, it seems to have worked out. I'm sure glad you didn't <laughs> follow my advice. Yeah. Oh my God. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about the rules. Uh, try and encourage teams around the world to register for this thing. Yeah. Get as many innovators, students talking about it. Uh, yeah. I mean, our, our goal is like basically to uh, do something that uh, it, you know to it, have it have it be sort of interesting, fun, and, and ultimately useful, um, and to spur uh, uh, creative ideas for what is actually the smartest way mm -hmm. to take the trillions of tons of carbon that we we've removed from the ground and will remove from the ground, mm -hmm. um, from deep, deep underground. And, and, and we've, we've placed that carbon in the atmosphere and oceans, um, which obviously changes the, the chemical constituency of the surface of the earth. Yeah. Um, and um, now, now I, 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 I should sort of um, measure, measure my statements in, in that um, I think I think we, the, the Earth, like I don't, I don't think we're currently doomed. To be clear, this is a very <laughs> important, uh, very, very importantly, um, you know, there's, there, there, there are people in all, all parts of the spectrum, from ranging from nothing to worry about, uh, CO2 is just makes things better, to uh, <laughs> we're doomed and there's nothing we can do about it. I am somewhere in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so m my concern with the CO2 is not kind of where we are today. Um, or even the, you know the current uh, rate rate of carbon generation, but really, uh, if it if we if carbon generation keeps accelerating and we keep getting um, a uh, that that uh, uh, increase in the in the Keeling curve, you know the CO two parts per million in the atmosphere, and if, if 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 we keep going and if we're complacent, uh, then I think we we could th there is some risk of of um, sort of nonlinear climate change. Um, so. Um, so you know, thus far we, the, the we've seen the CO two parts per million be, be fairly linear on a, on our time scale, uh, although it looks very exponential on uh, geologic time mm -hmm. scale. Um, and uh, but th there are certain potential nonlinear events, like uh, if we raise the temperature to the point where we um, melt the Siberian traps or something like that, and the methane escapes. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's just a, a massive amount of of sort of frozen dead uh, plant and animal matter um, in um, in Siberia, there's potentially trapped uh, uh, gases deep in the ocean. If you if the ocean warms, yeah. that could be released. So, uh, you, you know, these this is just these are just risks that are not wise to take. Um, and since we know that uh, long term, we're going to have to have renewable energy anyway, um, uh, because we'll, we'll we'll run out of oil and gas. It's not going to last forever. Um, so we know we know where this ends up. This has to end up with uh, renewable, sustainable. Energy, um, it's tautological. Um, but it's really, just a question of do we try to get there sooner or later? Um, you know, and, and we should try to get there sooner. It's, yeah. uh, it's obvious. Well, wh why run the? Why run the? Ex uh, how long do you want to run this experiment? Yeah, it's, and, it's and also true that even if we stopped CO two production, that's probably still not enough. That we do need mechanisms for extraction of CO two from the atmosphere and the oceans that well, don't exist right now. You know, I said I, I, I am. People sometimes think I'm sort of like, I, I, I'm kind of in the middle of the spectrum, you know, um, I think if we stopped CO2 production today, which obviously we could not do without civilization coming to a grinding halt <laughs> um, and mass starvation and, and all sorts of terrible things happening, um, 
we could not stop the CO2 generation today, but I think at the, you know, at the sort of 400, possibly even 500 ppm level, I, I think it's pro probably okay. Um, but if, uh, you know, as the, as the world industrializes, and we're sort of at 8 billion people, get to 9 billion people, um, have uh, a lot more industrial output per person, um, you could see the, you know, you know, at, at what, what might be okay, it's sort of four or 500 um, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere might become quite dire at a mm. thousand. Yeah. Um, and the trend is certainly in that direction if we don't do anything about it. So um, that, that's why I think it's just probably an unwise experiment to, to run. Um, even if you think that the, this is, this is why I think it sh should be a compelling argument to even those who um, would uh, assign a low probability to um, increase CO2 causing problems. Like mm -hmm. let's say you think it's 99.9% .9 likely that, uh, that adding all the CO2 to the ocean's atmosphere is, is going to be fine. So, that you, so you're saying there's a 0.1% chance of disaster. Well, there's only one, we're still, right now we're only got one planet. <laughs> well, even a 0.1% chance of disaster, why run that risk? Yeah. That's crazy. So, um, so I think th th what's likely to play out is that we will continue to add a lot of, a uh, lot more CO2 to the ocean's atmosphere. Um, and also, you know, ocean acidification, as you know, is, is also an issue. It's, you don't want to, you don't want to sort of add carbonic acid to the oceans and, and change the pH level because um, it destroys reefs and, and all that. So Which it's actively doing right now as yeah. we're watching. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, th yes. So this is a problem. No, I remember um, when I first met you, Elon, uh, you had, it was about 2000, and I remember you had two massively transformative missions. It was yeah. one making the uh, making humanity multi-interplanetary, yeah. and the second was bringing us to a sustainable economy, yeah. a, sa a sustainable energy economy. Right, exactly. And I think you've done pretty damn good. <laughs> are, you, are you happy with the progress you've made? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's hard to complain. It's, you know, the outcome so far has been, been great. Um, Although obviously, to be, you know, we've we've not uh, we've not yet sent anyone to Mars, yeah. and um, and hopefully will in the future. And um, in fact, just uh, a few days ago, or last early last late last week, I guess um, NASA awarded SpaceX a contract. Awesome, to 2.8, 2.9 billion billion uh, dollars yeah, for the next lunar lander. Yeah, to, so SpaceX a SpaceX craft will be the the next craft to put humans on uh, on the moon. I believe the first human will be a woman actually this time. Yes. So, uh, this is very, this is great. Yeah. Um, so, um, but of course we have to actually do it. Um, and uh, and uh, then we've got, t tomorrow we've got the, uh, our third astronaut launch to yeah, the space this station. Before we dive into the, to the carbon removal uh, rules and so forth. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's obviously a bit of a dichotomy because our rockets do produce carbon, you know. Uh, yeah, true. And like, oh, what a hypocrite. You know? True, no, no, uh, we, we uh, got. He's obviously <laughs> just, he's obviously just in for the money. Um, but, <laughs> but let's talk about let's talk about the crew two crew two mission. I feel I should address this. This aren't right. you being a hypocrite by launching rockets that that produce carbon? Uh, it, the, here, here's the problem is uh, right now there is there's really no way to get around the physics of a rocket. So uh, I think it's important for the long term uh, preserva preservation and and ultimately the expansion and extension of the, the, the scope and scale of consciousness uh, and the long term. Uh, probably a survival of humanity and life as we know it, we must become a multi-planet species. Uh, because there are all these risks that we can't control. Yeah, existential risks. There's all these Asteroid existential strikes. Risks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's like... Super volcanoes. You know, we could do, a, a, you know, <laughs> we could have a World War Three uh, or something, you know. There's, um, like, I'm optimistic about the future, but you, but you could also say, like, okay, well, so how long do you think civilization will last before there's a catastrophic event? If you say infinity, you're, this is not correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> This is, this is not, uh, history does not suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> history just suggests we do dumb things to uh, civilizations all the time. You know, and, and you know, this is the ancient Egyptians, the Romans, ancient Romans, where are they now? <laughs> Let's do the video series. Where, where are they now? Yes. The civilizations the Babylonians, peak. Sumerians, yeah. the, yeah, you name it, you know. So, um, so there's uh, been many civilizations that have risen and fallen. And anyway, we've we got to preserve the, we're going to become multiplanetary, and, and right now the only way to do that is with um, with, with rockets that uh, do burn fuel. Um, but we do have a long-term plan for sustainability of um, of even rocket flights uh, by uh, generating uh, propellant uh, using um, 
sustainable energy, wind and solar, mm -hmm. uh, to generate uh, starting first with uh, liquid oxygen. Um, and for our Starship vehicle, uh, it's uh, almost 80% liquid oxygen yeah. uh, and 20% um, uh, uh, liquid methane. Um, and um, the oxygen, it's obviously pretty easy to create that. Uh, you just use um, wind and solar electricity and um, and you do air, air separator because you've got the oxygen already in the air. The plants are making the oxygen, um, so you can use just you can just use electricity basically, renewable electricity to create 80% of the propellant on the rocket. And then for the remaining 20%, uh, you can use the Sabatier process where you take you actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere and you combine that with water to create CH4 and, and more O2. Yep. Um, and that's and that's in fact what we would do on Mars. Sure. To generate propellant. Sure. So 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 there is a long-term plan for sustainable generation of propellant uh, for the rockets. I do want to emphasize that. Um, and if there's, some, if there's some other way to do that now, we, we certainly would. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm just trying try to sort of address this apparent inconsistency in, um, you know, if generating carbon is bad, wh why, why are you doing that with rockets? Yeah. And, and listen, I, I think it's a moral imperative for the human race to be able to move off Earth while we have the opportunity. Everything we yeah. know is uh, well, right yeah, here. I, and just because, like, it's um, it's, it's not it's <laughs> just one of the other criticisms. I sometimes feel like, oh, is this some escape hatch for rich people? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, they think it's like so. You know, going to Mars reads like that ad for for, for Shackleton going to the Antarctic. You know, it's it's dangerous, uh, it's uncomfortable, um, it's a long journey. You might not, you know, come back alive, um, but it's a glorious adventure, and uh, it'll be amazing, an, an amazing experience. And your name will go in history. Yes, you might not. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be uncomfortable, and you probably won't have good food, and uh, all these things, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah. if, if, if if an arduous and dangerous journey, w where you may not come back alive, um, but it's a glorious adventure, sounds appealing. And Mars you is still. The place. And that's you still the have that's the thousands of, of volunteers, if not millions of volunteers, who would yeah. want to go. I, I mean, honestly, a bunch of people probably will die in the beginning. It's, yeah. it's tough sledding over there. You We're know? an exploring um, species. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not for everybody. We don't want to make anyone go, so it's, like, <laughs> it's volunteers only. Um, uh, you have, a, you have a, uh, a Dragon capsule on the pad. Crew 2 is nominally, or you still go for launch tomorrow? Yeah. Awesome. You want to just spend two minutes uh, talking about the Crew 2 mission? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we've, so we've got hopefully a, a great mission planned for tomorrow. Uh, this will be our third flight of, uh, of people to the space station. We had the test mission with two astronauts, then the first sort of operational mission with four. This is our second operational mission with four. Um, you know, it's an international crew, um, a great group. Um, I was just looking online, they're sort of, you know, picking their sort of... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully not final meal, but <laughs> you know they can pick whatever their favorite, favorite food is, for, you know, from, from their country. And um, so I'm actually heading over there tonight to just to um, wish them wish them well. I was out at Pad um, 39A uh, to see the stack yesterday. <coughs> uh, a couple of things. One, Pad 39A historic. Yeah, it's this is where uh, people went to the moon. Yeah, from, Apollo from 11. That, from that pad. From that pad, uh, the first space shuttle launch back in '81, yeah. STS-1. Yep. And uh, so that's. It's a lot of like karmic responsibility to be operating. Yeah, from it's there. like Times Square, the Times yeah. Square of launch launch pads. It's amazing. Yeah, amazing. And uh, and the first stage has a beautiful patina on it. Uh, <laughs> it does. <laughs> it's uh, this will, yeah. There'll be the it'll be a, it's a reused stage. So um, it, w when the stages come back, they, they kind of get scorched. Yeah. So the the black thing. Some people think is that, is that sort of something. No, that's. It got scorched <laughs> but from reentry. Your team said they used to wipe it off to clean it, and then it's just like, why bother? It's, it's kind of hard to wipe off. It doesn't wipe off easily. Yeah. It, it's kind of like baked on there. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. You kind of have to repaint it, really. We were uh, having a discussion about, is it safer to use a stage that's flown already versus a new stage? Yeah, so um, I, I think I, I, what we'd say is like flight proven. Flight proven, yes. Yeah. So like a Lexus I mean, if this was an airplane, uh, <laughs> Do you want to be on the first flight of that airplane when it comes out of the factory, or do you want to be uh, on a later flight? I'd say let, let somebody, you know, l let the test pilots do their thing before you, you, you know, if you fly, fly a plane. So you, flying a plane, you want to see that plane has flown a few times before you get in, I think. Yeah. So uh, I, th I, I, sh I think it should be uh, on balance better. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll also, we'll also be reflying the, start reflying the, the spacecraft. The Dragon, well, yeah. The Dragon spacecraft. Beautiful. So we're trying I'm to get so the, Reusability is obviously very important. Um, 
it's, you know, in, in many arenas, so reusability is important. And I, reusability in rockets is important. I remember uh, being in Hawthorne, seeing your first your Falcon one there, and it was just amazing. Yeah. It's come. No, there's some funny pictures of uh, of basically the the sort of SpaceX as a as a, kind of like a kindergartner, <laughs> or, you know, um, and me, but me being like whatever, twenty years younger, um, and uh, yeah, we're just in this tiny little warehouse in El Segundo. Yeah, I remember um, it well. Yeah. Uh, before we go to jump into the guidelines, one last question, update on Starship, because that's yeah. what, I mean, Starship's taking us to the moon, taking us to Mars. That's and the it's, it's the, it is audacious. Can you compare it, is, it to the it Apollo? It is audacious, yes. Compare it to the Apollo vehicle, uh, the Saturn V, for comparison for a second, for folks to know, get a sense of it. Sure, well, I think the thing that's least obvious from when it's um, on the ground, it, from, the, from the videos and pictures, is the size of it. So, it's... Um, it's going to be the largest flying object ever, hmm. so it'll be uh, twice the thrust and uh, weight of the Saturn V. Amazing. So that's uh, just from a si and taller, um, so I including the launch escape tower. So it's a very tall rocket, um, 100, and 100, 120 meters tall. And, and because uh, it's so wide, yeah. the it, the proportions uh, right. are obscure. That fact, how big it is. Yeah, you can see in some of the pictures that have been released when it's landing on the moon, and the the, the people look like ants. It's <laughs> very, it's a big rocket. This is this this rocket is uh, capable of, um, you know, at least 100 tons and probably closer to 200 tons of useful payload to the surface of the moon. So and, we're, and we're, it's, it, we're it's like designed it to be far in excess of NASA's requirements. Yeah. Um, and so it's really intended to be something that uh, you know that can enable a permanently occupied uh, base on the moon. So, you know, we've got obviously a currently occupied a base in, in Antarctica, um, and it would be great to have one, of the, one on the moon as well. Yeah. Um, and you can do, you know, I think a lot more research if you have the scientists actually there. Um, and we could have uh, some, some very powerful telescopes. Um, no, it's, the moon, you know, there's some great sayings from, uh, from Robert Heinlein that said, if, you know, if God had wanted humanity to have space flight, they you know, she would have given us a moon. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's, it's a like great it's staging just, place. It's, 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 exactly. It's sort of it's just 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 off the coast. Um, <laughs> um, Mars is is much 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 further. Yeah. Um, uh, one yeah. last question. Uh, but, moon. But, yeah. So so, it's, yeah, so it's, but I think most, actually more important than the size of Starship is the fact that it is intended to be fully and yeah. rapidly reusable. Yeah. So this is the fundamental holy grail breakthrough needed for for. Uh, access to space. Uh, to, to make humanity a true space bearing civilization, we must have a fully and rapidly reusable rocket. Mm. Um, now we've made some progress in that direction with Falcon 9 where the booster is reusable and the uh, Dragon spacecraft uh, upper portion is reusable, um, but the, 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 the second stage is not reusable um, and, the, and, and I would say right now, uh, I would not say the Falcon booster spacecraft and, uh, and fairing, they're, they're not rapidly reusable. Like it takes a fair bit of effort, uh, less effort than the, uh, much less effort than the space shuttle took. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that it was a turnaround every year or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That yeah. four, uh, and it took like about a year, yeah. year to turn them around. Um, you know, we're, we're getting it down to um, a few months, basically, and soon, I think probably under a month uh, to turn around a booster. Um, but uh, it, it landing out to sea and then having to bring it back and then sort of uh, taking a, a month or so to, to get it ready for launches is still, I wouldn't call it rapid by air aircraft standards. Um, whereas um, Starship is intended to be both fully and rapidly reusable. So the, the booster comes right back to the launch pad, um, literally is caught by the, the, the launch tower. Yep. So it's... It lands and is actually caught by launch tower arms, as aspirationally. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, 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 that looks excitement, like science fiction. <laughs> excitement <great>. guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the booster gets, it, it comes back about six or seven minutes later, and it's, and it's caught, so it's, it's uh, right there, and then caught by launch tower arms and placed right back onto the launch stand. Amazing. And then the, the, the ship is, I actually want the ship also to be caught by the, um, the launch tower. Uh, now the ship will take, it takes at least 90 minutes to orbit the Earth. Yeah. Um, and um, we may take more than one, it may take uh, three or four orbits to get uh, the ground track realigned with the um, landing zone, yeah. The landing zone, depending on where you are. Yeah. 
Uh, but the point is that the ship will come back and be, uh, be, be right, land right by the tower and be placed right back on. And so, uh, we Like a 767, just refuel yeah. and go. It's, it's intended to be such that the booster can be used, I don't know, uh, a dozen times a day. And the, sh and the, ship, wow. the ship could be, you know, basically every couple of hours. And, the, that, that, and that's mostly about uh, reloading propellant and, um, hmm. and mounting the ship. Uh, and then the ship could probably be used, um, you know, probably every, in, in theory, every three hours if, if you can make the ground track match. Hmm. Um, but certainly every, say, six to nine hours, we'll tw call it twice a day for the ship. And we'll make more ships than there are boosters. So, and I think if you, once we have the uh, floating space platforms, we, we can set the, put the, um, position them such that the ship can come back in a single orbit. Amazing. Um, so then it could be like, you know, let's say if you can get three ship launches per day, that's a thousand flights a year. Uh, each with 100 to 150 tons of now we're, now we're talking a real space program. Yeah. Let's go to uh, let's go to the questions on on the uh, carbon removal prize. We'll be going to your questions at in Twitter at about about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. So Elon, this is the largest prize ever, ever, uh, largest incentive prize ever, and I would argue for one of the most largest civ uh, civilization scale challenges we have. Sure. And uh, we're going to get into the rules in a second so that folks who are looking at creating teams can understand why, the, why we created those rules. But why did you fund this? Let's start with the, the why there. Yeah, I think um, I wanted to spur ideas and thinking about uh, the long-term need to um, capture carbon. Um, and uh, you know, I think this is one of those things that's going to take a while to figure out what the right solution is. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially to figure out what, what the best economics are for, uh, for CO2 removal um, and, uh, and, and, and all the th think through all the consequences. You don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, just plant a bunch of trees. I'm like, that's not so easy, you know. Like, like a trillion the, trees. Sure, exactly. And then you've got to like, okay, well, how, you need to get fertilizer. Are you going to water them? Where's the water going to come from? Uh, what habitat are you potentially destroying where the trees used to be? It's, it's, not, it's not just a no-brainer if you just go plant, plant a bunch and, of trees. But it's not to say that's um, not a good, viable option. We should plant some trees. Yeah. I, I, I'm in favor of planting trees. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's just not a question of like, okay, the, the, um, you know, there are like vast sections of like, say, like the Sahara Desert or, or um, uh, the, you know, the, the, some large barren areas, very dry areas in the U.S. Um, where you could in theory plant a lot of trees, but you're going to need a lot of water, yeah. and you're going to need, like, like you're going to have to cultivate them. It's not like, a, they don't just throw some trees on the ground. You know? <laughs> um, we'll drop so, them from orbit. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, so just, we, it, we, I think it'll be good to sort of uh, kind of frame the, the frame the debate and, and understand, okay, what things are really going to move the needle? How much are they going to move the needle? Um, you know, it's, uh, if we're talking about getting tens or hundreds of billions of tons of carbon, in, in what form will that carbon be? Yeah. And, uh, will it be stable over time? Um, and like I said, ha like, what is it going to cost humanity to do? However it's paid for, what, what is it going to cost? What, what's the thing that's uh, going to take the, you know, be most affordable? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of open questions on this. There, um, there are. Let me, let me chunk the rules for, yeah. uh, for those listening. And uh, you and your team, an amazing team, and uh, uh, Marcus Extravor and Xenia Tata uh, and their team work really well together. So the first thing is that for a team to win this, and we'll talk about the prize amounts yeah. and so forth, they've got to actually build something that works yeah. and demonstrate something that can extract a thousand tons per year, a kiloton of carbon per year as a demo scale model. Yeah, uh, I think, um, by the way, we're, we're very much open to adjusting the rules to be clear to everyone, like, like meaning, um, if things aren't working, or for whatever reason, like uh, we need to adjust rules, we'll, we'll adjust rules. The the the, uh, the the fundamental goal is to um, have spent uh, 100 million, as, uh, and actually ended up being probably like 120 million or, or whatever with um, you know cost of managing the prize and everything. Um, so it'll be you know at the end of the day probably something like 120 million dollars spent, um, and uh, hopefully that's spent well and usefully, yeah. um, and that what comes out of it is something that um, uh, matters to the future. Um, so that, that's, the, uh, that's the goal, to be clear. Um, and so if people have, you know, uh, ideas for adjusting the rules, um, 
Yeah, you know, we're going out as guidelines, yeah. and uh, we're going to have, I think, till mid-May for get public feedback, tell yeah. us if we miss something. Right. We will turn them from guidelines to rules once we get really feedback. And we've gone out to so many of the amazing climate scientists out there. Yeah. And it's, yeah, unless the rules need to, need to be valid uh, for, the, for the four years of this prize duration. Yeah, so we're super open to critical feedback. Um, don't hesitate to, you know, yell and, and say, if, hey, this, this is how it should be different in some way or whatever, you know. Um, the goal is just to, like, let's have it be a useful exercise and, and have people have a good time trying to figure out this problem. I think it's sort of a, it's a fun problem to try to, to work on. Um, and, uh, yeah, we just want it to be useful at the end of the day, you know, and, 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 and have it not be sort of uh, just an academic exercise or something that never amounts to anything. I think one of the things that you've said and I've said is, you know, everything works on PowerPoint. Everything works in PowerPoint. <laughs> That's exactly. You could have a PowerPoint presentation for a teleportation system to the Andromeda Galaxy, and, and, and even have a simulation of like, look, here we are. Boom! You're in the on, according to the slide. You're so, now teleported to Andromeda. So and I'm like, uh, but it doesn't actually work. You so know? to win this prize, uh, a team actually during the four years has to build something that can at minimum pull out uh, a thousand tons of carbon per year yeah. so that they can show us that. Do they have to <laughs> do, do, do they have to pull out a thousand tons or just show that the rate it works? No, they have to pull out. Like a literal thousand tons, we weigh it. We're g- <laughs> <laughs> we don't scale. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna like, you know, they, maybe oh. you calculate it to okay. be a thousand tons. Okay. But the rate at which, <laughs> yes, they'll have to run it for a year to get a thousand tons out. But the, well, they have well, maybe if they run it for a month, that's okay. Uh, probably it's okay. 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 All right. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I mean, if they're about a month, they the have, a th- you know, like a hundred tons. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're just, it, it needs to fit on our weighing machine or something, you know, like, I don't know, we're going to weigh it somehow. We'll, we'll use How one of your know? ships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll go down the ship you automate. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, part of the, the actual physically doing it is that they can, they have enough data to calculate costs, which sure. are going to be important. Uh, but we're we're not looking for theory. We're looking for practice. And, yeah, and, it, and it, you know how hard it is to make something real. <laughs> It's very hard to make something real. I think, in, in, in my view, prototypes are trivial, and production is hard. Yeah. Um, and there's, the, in the, the, the general, um, generally people think it's the prototype that is the hard thing. Prototypes are, well, I, I mean, obviously you got to have that one percent of inspiration. But as the saying goes, it's one percent inspiration, ninety-nine percent perspiration. Yeah. Um, ideas are plentiful. Actually, getting it done is very hard. You could say, for example, uh, what about the, you know, the idea of going to the moon? It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Going to the moon is hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that's why <laughs> it's not the idea, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of ideas out there. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's execution. It's like <laughs> All right, so the second thing. This was thing. my idea to go to the moon. I patented it. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> See you there. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is, and this is a term that you that you use first, is that the teams have to be able to calculate the fully considered costs of pulling out the CO2. Sure. And what yeah. does that mean to you? Yeah, so I think fully considered cost actually just means that if there are, um, you want to look at both the benefits and the, the, the cost actually. So if, uh, if in um, sequestering carbon, removing it from the uh, atmosphere or oceans, uh, uh, has, has some, uh, perhaps some environmental impact, uh, which might be small, but it's not negative, mm-hmm. that certainly needs to be taken yeah. into account. Um, and, uh, uh, and then by the same token, if uh, what's done is in, in extracting carbon is uh, a useful product sure. and from which you can generate revenue, then that should count too. Right. So, I don't know, I'm just sort of saying f- for argument's sake, like let's say uh, you could create, um, you know, um, construction, ma- construction <laughs> material, like, you know, um, uh, cement. Cement. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Which we cement, just, I'll talk about that later. Or some kind of or yeah. s- useful rocks mm-hmm. that are u- rocks that are useful, or s- s- sand, or I don't know. Yeah. Um, something that's uh, useful for construction, um, then uh, you could say, okay, well, this is what we could sell it for. And, uh, you know, and, and then and just fully consider pros and cons and, 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 and say, okay, this is what, you know, if, if, um, if we need to pay to have it done in the future, which we probably will have to do, then um, what's, the, what's the lowest net cost? Yeah. And, and to be clear, the the working teams, the, what they do has to be net negative, right? It's not yeah. a break even. It's not pull out a thousand tons and then emit a thousand tons. And in fact, one of the things no, we no, talked okay, about. Absolutely. <laughs> one of the things we talked about. <laughs> Obviously. Talk, <laughs> yeah. One of the things we talked about. Sure, is it can't how, be worse than a disease. Yes. 
<laughs> how, how long do you need to sequester the carbon for us? We had a big debate. You want to share what you came up with there? What the team well, came up just with? Well, the, the, the rate of carbon um, sequestering is to far exceed the rate at which, say, it is uh, potentially dissolving back into the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, like, if, if uh, yeah. Um, and so one of the rules is that you have to be able to sequester for at least a hundred a hundred years, right? So we yeah. we set a, a target doesn't have to be forever, yeah. you know, a year is not long enough. Um, so we said you have to demonstrate that your methodology is going to contain the, the CO two in some fashion for a hundred years at least. Yeah, maybe with maybe there's a small amount that that is lost. Maybe it's not perfect. You yeah. know? I think we don't probably don't want to set it to, you know. Um, 100% for 100 years, I, but if it's like, I don't know, 90% for 100 years, that's probably okay, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it just needs to be something that if we scaled it up, would it work? Yeah, and that's the third part. Obviously. That's the third <laughs> part, which common is... common sense test, test, really. Yes, and the hardest thing is that the winning team has to prove to our judges that their approach can actually scale to a gigaton level. Otherwise, yeah. it's not going to be useful. Right. Exactly. It can't, it can't be a niche. Yeah. It can't be inherently niche. And if anybody knows about scaling up, I, I think yeah. you do. Uh, yeah, scale up. scaling is hard. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I don't know what the answer is here, really. Um, but I think if, if a lot of smart people work on this, w w there could be some really creative solutions. It's something generally useful for the world in, yeah, in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think just to be clear, like looking for pragmatic solutions, it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, you know, it's, but it, it's got to be something that's just fundamentally, if we scaled it up, would it, would it work? And that's it. <laughs> so let's talk about the prizes that are up for grabs. Um, first place is going to be 50 million, yeah. uh, which is significant. Our, our hope is that it's going to attract enough cognitive surplus out there to focus in on this. Yeah. Um, 30 million for, uh, split between sort of a second, third, and fourth place prize. And one of the things that uh, you and your team put forward is maybe it might be split into different categories, sure. right? Uh, different approaches. Yeah, I, I mean, we want to reward people who have done great work. Yeah. Uh, fun, fundamentally, I'm I'm open to increasing the price size too over time. So, if it turns out like, hey, somebody really, really kicked ass, and and uh, and somehow there's not a price for them, we'll I'll add some more to the price. That's that's extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't um, want somebody to have like spent like, you know, massive blood, sweat, and tears have done something useful. And they get nothing for it. That would be pretty bad. Yeah. So, um, but, but I, I think also, um, you know, this somebody's going to probably get a company out of this. You know, because I think this will be a need long term, and you know, so, uh, and and uh, so this is kind of like you can th also think of it as like you know free venture money. Yeah. You know, non dilutive uh, venture capital. Not, yeah. A non and free 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 money for a company. Yeah, and hopefully we're also creating a, a massive marketplace and proving to people that there is there's a there there here. Yeah. So 50 million uh, for the first uh, 30 million split among second, third, and fourth. In the next year, we're taking 15 million dollars and distributing a million dollars to the top 15 teams that appear to be making the most progress and the yeah. most real. Just giving some people some seed money, basically. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you've set aside five million for student teams, yeah, which is exactly. real important. You want to talk about student teams? I know you're passionate about that. Yeah, yeah, we've we've done a lot of uh, student competitions, for example, with Hyperloop, um, yeah. just trying to, uh, you know, spur ideas in advanced transportation, um, and it's, it's really just basically uh, an electric car and a vacuum tube, <laughs> <laughs> to be precise. I mean, uh, and we've we had several of them, and and um, you know the, the the last Hyperloop competition, I actually I got like I think halfway to the speed of sound. Uh, <laughs> so, pretty yeah, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> and and the, the thing was, t you had to get to the fastest speed and then de and then stop without crashing. Yeah. Um, so, um, that's pretty, it's, it's kind of exciting. It's like, is this thing gonna, you know, get what speed is it gonna get up to? Are they gonna slam the brakes on in time or is it gonna <laughs> hit the crash barrier at the end? So it's, pr it's pretty fun. And, and th then we kind of got to, th 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 we, we, we uh, put that on pause and now we're doing uh, tunneling competitions. Oh, uh, nice change that yeah it, that technology has not changed that much in a century no honestly i think we, we're we're gonna you know i mean for i don't know five or seven years i for a long time i was like people asked me what opportunities do you see i said tunneling and they would think i was joking but um i think this is the way to solve traffic in um, congested cities now, almost every major city is congested so 
and, and with, uh, as autonomy uh, gets better and better and you have robo-taxis and everything, um, the robo-taxis will be cheaper than a bus or subway. And people will want it and it'll take you point to point, it, you know, even when it's like raining and snow. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, so it's, it's going to be better also, I think, for, you know, from a public health standpoint, like if there's another pandemic and, you know, how yeah. do you get around, you know? Yeah. It's like, you, uh, you know, it's just difficult to go in, in crowded spaces. So um, then, uh, anyway, so I think tunnels are going to be really important in the future for relieving congestion in, um, in cities. So, um, you know, I, I hope others start tunnel tunneling companies um, and, and just improve tunneling technology. And, um, that you can have like these warp tunnels just going all the way through this, <laughs> you know, 3D, but multiple levels. And um, we're, we're the first operational one in Vegas. That's yeah. uh, it's going to go into operation, I think, in a few months. Uh, uh, you so know, we could sit here and talk about macaque monkeys playing pong as oh well yeah, on Neuralink. Pong. That was amazing. Yeah, that was wild. awesome. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not going to go there. I'm going to focus still on uh, on our on our. I played mind pong against the monkey. You did? Did it win? Yeah, no, oh. but uh, what, but it hadn't practiced as much yet, so. Now it might be able to beat me. Monkeys have very good agility. Yeah. Yeah, like, no, they've like got to catch the branch. Like they can swing through the trees, and we cannot. <laughs> Not very well, you know. Um, yeah. So uh, I think a monkey actually could, could play like a fast twitch video game really well. That's great. Better, maybe better than a human. You can sponsor a team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Esports, <laughs> it's just monkeys. Yeah, Macaques <laughs> yeah. against the best teams. Yeah, it turns out the monkeys actually love playing video games and, uh, and, so do my and, drink, and drink the smoothies. No, it's just like humans. <laughs> I mean, basically, humans love snacks and video games, and so do monkeys. You know? oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, we're about to go to questions in, uh, in two minutes. I know we've got a stack of them. Uh, I just want to hit on there are four categories that teams can, can uh, put. Uh, their approaches forward. Uh, first is direct air capture. Pull it out of the air. Any yeah. comment on that? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, this you can certainly pull it out. There's there's lots there's lots of ways to get carbon out of the air. Yeah. Uh, um, you can adsorb it ma many different ways. Yeah. Category um, two is ocean, sort of algae, kelp, plankton. Um, uh, a lot of CO2 in the oceans. People don't realize that. Mm -hmm. uh, category three, land. Um, Trees. I mean, uh, Mark Benioff has, you know, been backing a trillion trees project. I mean, that where, is. Where are they going to be planted? We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's, by the way, when people say that world Earth is being overpopulated, mm -hmm. uh, this is I, not true. It, it's like look out the window, and I know you and I have had this conversation that you're more worried about underpopulation of planets. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Earth is going to face a massive population collapse yeah. uh, in, in, a, in a, over the next. 20, 30 years, massive. Yeah, um, and it's th this. This is definitely you know, well, civilization. You know, the question of like, is civilization gonna die with a bang or a whimper? This would definitely be dying with a whimper. Yeah, we um, we need. We need the birth rate is very low. Yeah, right? it's it's been dropping. Right, it used to be five, yeah. six children per family. Globally, it's like two point four. Below in the U.S., it's below below replacement levels. Fourth, uh, I mean, in, in in most of Europe, Russia, Japan, Korea, Singapore, yeah. um, you know, uh, it's. Uh, it's well below replacement. Um, but I would still say, yeah, so. are you? I mean, when we spoke last about this, are you still a sort of abundance optimist that the world is getting better on many levels? Yeah, I, I think the, the the world is generally getting better. Um, you know, I have some concerns about advanced AI, like the, um, you know, uh, that that that's a risk. Um, if I say like existential risks, I'd, I'd say. Um, Super advanced AI is one, mm -hmm. um, and and probably the s second biggest risk after that is population collapse. Not yeah. asteroid impact. No, if pop the population collapse. The thing about uh, uh, demographics and birth rates, you know what's going to happen in 20 years because you know the birth rate, yeah. rate last year. Yeah. It takes like 20 years for a person to grow up. Yeah. So we we know what the adult population is going to be 20 years from now because we know w what kids were born last year. Um, I think. It's we have a, a serious issue with population collapse. Mm. Um, that's far bigger than people realize. Um, and and you know this the the social networks and everything. We're not, I mean the, the social support networks were not really set up for a, a high ratio of retirees to workers. Somebody so so then well or, thank I mean, God we, we got we robots we coming in. Yeah, yeah, the robots exactly. We'll need those. We'll need those robots. But yeah. you, you don't want to have the the youth effectively enslaved to take care of the elderly. You know, which is what would kind of happen if, if you have an upside-down uh, demographic pyramid. 
Um, let's get to the questions. First of all, uh, if you're interested in the guidelines or to register a team, go to xprize.org. You can download the guidelines again up until I think May 13th. We're looking for uh, public comment. Please tell us what we could do to improve it. And then please register you know, as a team so we can communicate with you if you're interested. Uh, before we go to the questions, and you go to uh, XPRIZE's uh, Twitter account, at XPRIZE, to ask questions, uh, let's go to a short video from uh, Dr. Marcus Extravar. We call him Dr. X. He is the lead for us, an amazing, brilliant individual uh, who leads our carbon and climate work. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's uh, see what Dr. Extravar has to say. I'm looking for $100 million answers that can help change the course of human history and help heal our planet. But what's the question? In the next 100 seconds, I'm going to explain. I'm Marcus Extivor, Vice President of Energy and Climate at XPRIZE. The question is, how do we take centuries of CO2 emissions out of the air and oceans? If you've got the skills to answer that question, we'd love to hear from you today. Now, let's start with the basics. We've got to reduce our CO2 emissions and get to net zero. But net zero is not enough. We also have to go carbon negative, and we need to get there fast. That means taking CO2 that's currently in the air and oceans, removing it, and storing it for a long, long time. Do you know how to remove CO2 using the land, oceans, rocks, or even taking CO2 directly out of the air? We've got to get the CO2 from up here and locking it away down here. We know plants and trees can do this and been doing it for a long time. They're great at this, but do you know how to help plants and trees sequester that CO2 in the vegetation and soils in a way that's durable and can last for centuries? How do we use the oceans to sequester vast amounts of CO2? Kelp and seagrasses are great at this, and about a third of our emissions are already in the oceans. Do you know how to remove it and sequester it safely? What about rocks and helping them remove CO2? Many rocks can do this naturally, but the process takes thousands of years on its own. Do you know how to dramatically speed that up? Now you might already have an amazing idea in direct air capture, in soil sequestration, or tree planting, or farming, or maybe kelp farming and seagrass, marine biology, ocean alkalinity enhancement, geologic sequestration, mineralization, and enhanced weathering, or maybe a technique no one's heard of before. We want your $100 million ideas. Enter the largest incentive prize in history. Visit xprize.org to find out how to register a team and get involved. Together, we can help balance Earth's carbon cycle and protect our climate for future generations. What does a $100 million answer look like? It looks like any other crazy idea. It just has to work. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, we're so, we're so uh, lucky to have amazing people, which is what SpaceX and Tesla, I mean, people who care about, about changing the world. All right, we're gonna go to uh, some questions. Um, let's, uh, we have some over here. The first one is from Chuck Brady in Austin. Uh, Chuck is uh, one of our innovation board members, one of the earliest funders that did the background work in the climate for here. And so, so I found this question uh, super fascinating. So he says, if the bogey is 10 gigatons per year, uh, and the global economic output is $87 trillion, at least it has been the last year, then at $200 per ton uh, to sequester uh, uh, cost sequestration is $2 trillion, or about 2% of the global GDP. So it seems like a reasonable drag in overall economy uh, if we could stop or reverse climate change. The shortcoming right now is we don't have a scalable way yet to capture and sequester CO2. So that's the background. That yeah. seems like a reasonable <laughs> estimate. So here's his yeah, first question. Uh, should competing teams prioritize scalability over cost? And what lessons from Tesla and SpaceX have you learned uh, to help teams thinking about uh, the design of their solutions? Well, I think it's not, unless the cost is affordable, it's not scalable. I mean, I thought the, the prior math was, was pretty sensible there. Um, you know, we could, we could afford something perhaps which is um, one or two percent of GDP, but it would be extremely painful if it was 20% of GDP. Yeah. Um, we'd start having to cut into healthcare and, and, and all sorts of you know, social care programs. Um, and if it's 200% of GDP, it's not happening at all. Yeah. Um, so we want to just let them know that the audio feed's coming uh, through. Yeah, uh, uh, Chuck uh, has a second question I also thought was really important. It says, uh, while we want the lowest cost uh, that will do a gigaton per year uh, or more, uh, inevitably, there are going to be trade-offs between cost and scalability. Uh, no, actually, I think um, something's not scalable unless it, the cost is uh, is low. Yeah. So, 
uh, or at least if the cost at scale is low. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess cost and scale, but you could say like I could plant a tree. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, it, we just need to solve the problem, and 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 so both uh, cost and scalability need to be addressed. Um, it's like, is it going to be remove enough carbon to matter, mm -hmm. and can we afford it as a civilization? Yeah, those are the two things that that matter. Yeah, um, and then just obviously making sure that it, in in sequestering the, the carbon, we're not uh, at the same time creating uh, some new environmental issue um, so I mean that's an important point right uh, that we're not creating a new environmental issue at the same time that we are yeah yeah or, or, or maybe it is but it can only be must, uh, th basically the cure is gonna be much better than the disease yeah <laughs> obviously yeah um, so just like, like you know you take 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 some medication some maybe there's like s slight side effects but but you, you generally want the medication to be much better than the disease. <laughs> um, so it just got to make sense. Like we can see a path to this, um, to working at scale and, mm -hmm. and solving the problem. Yeah. It has to have some chance of that. Paresh Galani from Los Angeles, uh, one of our Vision Circle members says, uh, who do you think should be paying for the cost of carbon capture? Is it government, oil industry, attacks across everyone? Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense about that? Well, generally the, the uh, market systems work very well when prices are accurate. And the problem we have right now is that uh, we're not correctly pricing the cost per ton of CO2 in the atmosphere and oceans. So, um, and there are various attempts to try to get, get at this with uh, subsidies and whatnot, but, but really the market system will work, w work well if the, if the market systems work well if there is not a pricing error. Yeah. Um, and we have a pricing error in that we are not paying for this externality. It's in classic economics, it's just an unpriced externality in the, uh, we're, we're not paying for our garbage removal. Uh, so then garbage <laughs> piles up, you know, so, um, and so the, the logical thing to do, and I think the, you know, vast majority of economists would agree, is to uh, put a tax on carbon, um, and then you can find ways with, with uh, tax rebates and whatnot to make sure it's not a regressive tax, that it does not unfairly, um, uh, you know, negatively, pr disproportionately negatively affect uh, the people on low incomes uh, with, with uh, tax rebates and stuff. Yeah. So. I think that's the way to, that, that, that's the thing that systemically I think is important uh, to address it. Um, if you correctly price something, the market system works. Yeah. Prices are just information. We have the wrong information. So. Uh, Julio from Dublin says, uh, do you expect the technologies coming out of this competition to have any uh, use on, on Mars, for example? And P.S., thank <laughs> you for what you're doing for humanity. Uh, yeah, I think so. Interesting thing on Mars is um, that uh, Mars is a primarily CO2 atmosphere, uh, though it also has some uh, nitrogen and carbon and other trace elements. Um, and ni nitrogen and argon, I should say, in addition to pri primarily CO2. Um, so, uh, in order to produce propellant on Mars, uh, we, would we would take the CO2 from the atmosphere, combine that with water ice. Um, Mars has a lot of ice uh, yeah. under the dust. It's amazing um, that we didn't that 20 years ago that wasn't known. I mean, we're discovering it every place now. Yeah, yeah. M Mars is just is basically covered in ice. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just got dust too, so you know, it's hard to see the ice under the dust. But uh, th there's, there's I, I believe um, if if you warmed Mars up, you'd have an ocean with an average depth depth I think of almost a mile or something like that wow. on the northern part of the of the planet. It's like something like 40 percent of the planet would have an ocean potentially up to a mile mile deep or something like that. Extraordinary. Um, like a, like a, no, a big. It wouldn't be like just a little lake or something like that. So um, more, so, so you take uh, the water ice, H2O, and you combine that with the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, you use something like this Sabatier process where you run it over a ruthenium catalyst and uh, you get um, the, the, the um, basically... Methane. Yeah, you get methane. You get CH4 uh, and O2 oxygen. Um, and that's, um, that's actually why we designed the Starship to use uh, methane oxygen, is because we can actually create that and refuel uh, sustainably. On Mars. Yeah, in fact, literally by pulling the CO2 out of the atmosphere, that's combining with water, yeah. and, then, uh, and then using that as propellant. And so, uh, actually by its very nature, Mars has to have a sustainable, um, sustainable, energy, a sustainable rocket propellant. Yeah. So, 
Let's um, go to uh, India. Uh, Rohan Kumar from Mumbai says, why don't you simply implement the available technologies on a larger scale? Like which technology? Yeah. <laughs> Tree planting. Uh, I, mean, I, 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 I think there should be more trees. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, I would say that <clears throat> there currently does not exist technologies that can scale to the gigaton level at a reasonable cost. And that's the underlying purpose of this competition is to, uh, to either, either demonstrate existing technologies can and teams can use whatever technologies they want or to really innovate and come up with new approaches. It's like, yeah. yeah. It, well, the thing is that uh, generally, if, if trees can grow somewhere, they generally, you usually do grow. They, they, you know, they, like unless some of the, they generally. Yeah, there's no one there pulling them out other than humans in the Amazon. Yeah. Pretty, yeah, I mean, the, the Amazon is quite a thick, quite a big, 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 thick jungle. I've flown up the Amazon many times, and that is one hell of a jungle. Um, <laughs> um, in fact, it, like you would fly for long periods of time and see n nothing, no lights, no fires, no nothing, um, just darkness. And then eventually, like, fly over Brasilia, the capital, and like out of nowhere, there's a bunch of lights. Um, but but there's just there's you know in in order to have a big increase in uh, in, in tree biomass, you, we would have we would have to irrigate uh, and um, you know and pro um, provide manure, you know, like like basically fertilizer, and um, it we'd have to cultivate. Make it ha uh, ha uh, hospitable uh, for the trees to grow. Yes, yeah, so and then you say, okay, well, what's the energy cost of the of the fertilizer and the getting the fresh water there and um, you know, just m making it habitable for trees. It's, 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 you've got to factor in the, you know, the energy cost of the fertilizer and, and the energy cost of the water mm -hmm. and all that. So it's like, okay, what's the actual net carbon result? It's, it's not as good as people might think. It's, again, I'm not saying I'm anti-tree, I'm pro-tree. <laughs> but it, but, it, but, it, but it, it would just be very difficult to, to blanket the Sahara with trees. Yeah. Um, so let's, this is an important one here. Uh, as teams are coming together, uh, so Grant in Washington, D.C. says, uh, what is Elon's and Peter's process of building a strong team? And ultimately, I think the quality of your team is everything. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. So That's what's how you your, get things done. How do you, I mean, when you start a new company like, like Neuralink or Boring, uh, how do you recruit that first core team? When Neuralink and Boring are very small companies, I should be emphasized. Like these are um, t tiny compared to SpaceX and Tesla, which mm. is sure. Oh, well, well, uh, well over ninety percent of what I do is just SpaceX and Tesla. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, Neuralink and Boring Company are each just a, a few hundred people. Um, but how do you? At, but at these teams Tesla's are eighty thousand people. That's incredible, dude. Yeah. So it's Tesla's big. Uh, SpaceX is like over eight thousand people. So. But how do you um, recruit that your initial team to work on something? Is it do you put out word? Do you uh, do you know somebody typically? Do you build around somebody else? Do you pull from your existing companies? Well, it varies. I mean, um, my my I mean, the first company way back in the day, uh, Zip2. Um, what I did was um, um, I just wrote software. You know, so I didn't have any money. So I came out to. With Zip2, I came out to go do grad studies at Stanford. Um, I had $100,000 in like student debt and one computer. Um, and I was going to actually work on um, uh, advanced capacitors for Houston electric vehicles. I remember that. You yeah. said that. Way, way back in the day. Yeah. Um, so, and I'd spent a couple summers working on that before in, in Silicon Valley before um, going to Stanford. And then that, that summer, I was like, well, you know, the, the internet's going to be something that really changes. The, the, it's going to be one of the biggest impacts on on humanity you know it's like humanity uh, communication will go from being like osmosis to humanity having a nervous system where you could access any part of humanity's knowledge from from anywhere from any connection anywhere you could be in the middle of the Amazon jungle and have access to all of humanity's information more, more than if somebody was living in the Library of Congress so it's like well I, I want to be part of creating that and so I just started writing software I've been writing software for a long time but um, I actually wrote the first uh, maps and directions on the internet, the first white pages, the first yellow pages, um, by myself. Um, and then, uh, you know, the hi we hired a few interns, uh, and then my brother joined, another friend of mine, Greg Curry, who's passed away. And, um, and then we got some venture funding. Um, I thought it was crazy that these guys were going to give us, like, 
they gave us like three million dollars and i was like this is insane like so we're, it's just us and some interns uh <laughs> and then they're giving us three million dollars this is crazy they must capital. be mad so <laughs> I, I think what i'm hearing you say is if you know the the first most critical part of the team is you as the as the founder and the passionate yeah, individuals try to do useful things um let's try and squeeze in a few more a well few i mean I, I think like yeah. the th things you have to remember like for 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 spacex it was just literally like okay we 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 need to become multi you know multi planet species and um but I, th these are like long answers so uh, I, but but i think in general if you want to re recruit people uh that are you know really talented and driven you have to say you have to state what the what's the mission what's the problem we're trying to solve yep and and uh and, and just be clearly willing to, you know, pour a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it, um, and have a convincing argument for why it matters. Yep. Um, you know, there's, you know, say like there's three three major things for, um, you know, in terms of motivation. Uh, it's like first of all, somebody's got to look forward to coming to work in the morning. Like if they're, like, are they enjoying the the, the work itself intrinsically? Um, that's very important, um, and. Uh, the right work environment can really make make a big difference there. I think the I, ideally is that they also feel like that their rewards will receive um, fair uh, financial compensation, like that they that you know the, that the financial rewards are are are, re, are good mm -hmm. and fair. Uh, and then third, for the really for the best people in the world, they'll want to know are they is what they're doing going to matter? Yeah. Like so, uh, if they spend ten years doing this, it will it make a difference to the world, or you know, will people notice? What would matter? You know? Can I get the next question, please? Uh, Lee uh, from San Diego says, the XPRIZE just awarded $20 million in prize money related to carbon removal. Uh, can you explain what the difference is between that and the Musk Foundation's XPRIZE? Uh, we had a $20 million uh, Energy COSIA prize for pulling CO2 out of the smokestack of a natural gas and coal plant and turning okay. it into a product more profitable in the cost of extraction and we just uh, the two teams that won that were creating uh, concrete and, uh, right. and they're up in scaling so it's a you know now it's instead of just out of the, the plants right now and thank you to Wyoming uh, for their support there um, it's now can we pull it out on a global a global level okay um, but what sort of tonnage are they able to do uh, I actually don't know the okay. answer uh, but uh, 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 Nandan from India says, can a 17-year-old register, uh, given that I have the resources and ideas? Uh, yeah. I, I think so, sure. I, I think... Is there, uh, there's no age limit? There's no age limit. We're, in fact, student teams are going to be important. Um, Oli from London says, technology is a piece of the climate change solution, but how do you change behavior and habits? What do you think about that? I think changing people's behavior and habits is tough. Yeah. Um, or basically, if you're trying to convince people to make life more, more miserable for themselves, this is a, a hard argument to win. Yeah. Um, so with, with Tesla, when we, when we created Tesla, we're like, okay, look, we're we, we got to make a car that's exciting and, and, and fun and, and looks good. Uh, and then people don't have to, if you're trying to convince people to, that in order to save the environment, you have to wear a hair shirt <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and make life miserable and your food's going to be terrible. It's, that's a, this is an uphill battle, okay? So at Tesla, we're like, we're just going to make electric cars that are better than gasoline cars. Yeah. Faster, yeah. lower cost for maintenance. Yeah. They yeah. look beautiful, they're faster, and they have also, you know, cool advanced technology, they're more fun. Um, and you don't have to go to gas stations, which are nasty. Um, and so, you know, but you've got to solve the long distance problem with superchargers. Um, so I think it is actually, you know, uh, going to be, be way more palatable to people if, 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 it's, uh, if whatever solution is, is removing carbon does not make their quality of life worse. Yeah. One last question here from, uh, from Godfrey in New York. Um, I know Godfrey. He has uh, got ALS, and uh, he is loving his fully self-driving Model S. Okay. Well, I mean, it's not fully self-driving. Yeah, I know, I know, but but, um, about <laughs> but it's getting there. It's, it's getting, getting there. there. It's getting there. And uh, and so he's. I mean, for people who are disabled, it's extraordinary yeah. technology that's coming. And he's a he's a brilliant, uh, brilliant human being. He says, "Hi, Elon. Big fan of your work. Massively and eternally grateful to you for being a powerful source of inspiration to me. Can you please share uh, who and what inspires you and drives you to be so insanely productive uh, at a superhuman level?" So what, who and what? 
Um, well, I don't know. I think uh, I, I, I was, uh, I was always kind of like a crazy kid, I suppose. Um, I was just very curious about the world and um, how do we come to be here? What's the meaning of life and all that? And uh, um, I always had a really in intense desire to understand things and learn. Um, Yeah, I mean, I had sort of an existential crisis, I guess, when I was I know, 11 or 12 or something, trying to figure out what it's all about, you know. And uh, ultimately came to, came to the conclusion that um, we don't really know the answer, but, uh, but if we increase the scope and scale of civilization, then we, uh, we have a much better chance of understanding the meaning of life and why, why we're here or even what are the right questions to ask. So, therefore, we should strive to expand the scope and scale of consciousness to better understand the questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. Yeah. Well, on behalf of uh, the human race, <laughs> on behalf of everybody watching, Elon, thank you for all that you do. I, I know you, you work 24-7 and driven by passion, so. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm just uh, grateful for what you've done, and thank you for supporting and, and launching this uh, this X Prize, it's meaningful beyond belief, and hopefully now it's everybody else's turn to try and, and dig in and form teams. Yeah, I hope you all have a good time and, and you know, some, some productive stuff comes out of it. That'd be great. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, for everybody uh, tuning in, uh, I know we have literally thousands of questions. We're gonna be going to, uh, to Twitter Spaces Live, which is Twitter's new uh, audio chat feature, Dr. Marcus Extravor. And Xenia Tata and I will be there to engage and answer as many questions <laughs> as we can about the rules. Is this uh, like Twitter's clubhouse thing? This is Twitter's <laughs> clubhouse, yes. yes. Okay. Awesome. So, um, pal, uh, again, uh, I'm going to be there tomorrow morning. Okay, Good luck cool. with the launch. Yeah, it's going to be a late night. I, I'll, I'll be up uh, all night because um, launch is pretty early in the morning. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap on you for my invitation to, the, uh, to Boca Chica for a, uh, sure. a Starship flight. It's pretty wild seeing that. Uh, it it's, is. Uh, that feels like the future. It, uh, it's pretty insane. Yeah, yeah. Buck Rogers, here we come. Yeah, yeah. All right, see you guys in Twitter spaces. Elon. All right. Thanks, Thanks Peter. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.